but I hope <laughs> no, I will do my best. So what I want to talk about is future uncertainties in mobility solution design. And what we are working on is a scenario-based design support framework. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is later. Uh, my name is Jack Gall. I'm a PhD student here um, at IRT, at LGI, the Laboratoire Genie Industriel at Central Cipelec. And at my heart, I always stay an urbanist. So you will see a couple of references to the spatial dimension of, of things because it's uh, the background for me. I'm going to talk about three different parts. First, a bit the context and the motivation, what we are working on, um, the contributions or some of the contributions so far, and the methodologies we are applying, and then talk a little bit, at least briefly, about the practical application which we are working on. To start with, the, the context is, yeah, I started in October 2020 at the Anthropolis Chair. I'm supervised by Bernard Yanou from the Laboratoire Genie Industriel, Flor Valle, who you have already heard, and Sylvie, who has been already very active already this morning as well, um, who is a senior researcher at UDF. So we have a bit the different uh, disciplines. And generally, we are at an interdisciplinary um, perspective, a bit with design science, urban studies, complex system engineering, and everything what's somehow related to mobility, transportation, and so on. And we have two different um, application areas. One is the metropolitan Paris area, but more in particular, the community de Bac so the, the yellow part is here. And then there's a second case study where I'm going to talk a little bit about later. You see our partners, but we had the introduction already earlier. And very general, I think there's no need to repeat that, but there are, there are different, very, very global challenges which are connected to mobility. So of course, everything related to the environment, greenhouse gas emission, also noise, the resource constraints and so on. There's a socio-spatial justice element. I think uh, we had a very nice presentation from WIDAT about it earlier. So the, the different stakes there, but also the economy. So for example, there's a huge, huge amount of money lost every year in the greater Paris area through, um, we, uh, now I'm mixing in French and my English is even worse. <laughs> Um, the, the economic stress which can be put on the just or the, the inefficiencies of the mobility system. And to summarize a little bit, we, we also refer to the SDG 11.2, which, which asks for the safe, affordable, accessible and sustainable transport systems until 2030, which are accessible to all. So there's also the inclusivity part integrated. But that's a global part. On the other side, we have a very strong local diversity. So most of you probably know the image on the left, that's the Rue de Rivoli. In Paris, which has been transformed a lot at the beginning of COVID. In the middle, you have, I think, a quite beautiful photo from the Saclay Plateau, where you see the construction of the Metro 18. For at least the ones who are here have seen it this morning. One of the biggest infrastructure projects at the moment. We are currently somewhere back here. Already, these are completely different, despite that many people are using both of them on the same day. And then, again, I will talk a bit more about it later. There's Cairo, which is one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the world where it's incredibly high density, where you have completely different mobility offers, challenges, and uh, socioeconomic system. So all of them have their particularities, and we try to not, even if we are working with very particular cases, we are trying to find ways which can be applied to different contexts. That's one part of the complexity. Another one is the time. So we talked already about perspective a little bit in the morning and the temporal dimension. And here you see different, so some of them, I think you saw earlier in Julian's, presentation, the different documents, the different policies and so on, which exist and their timeframes. So when were they published and until when do they refer in the documents? You see there's a strong variety between the different scales, but also, and that doesn't go only for policies, but also for products and services. Many of the solutions are created, or let's say we have an idea today, you solve mobility after this great colloquium in the evening and you're like, okay, this is what I want to do. It will take six, seven, eight years, depending on what sector it is until the solution is actually implemented and then you want the solution maybe to last for another 10 years or 15 years or possibly longer so there are a lot of temporal issues and the question which we are asking if we are really prepared for the context and the needs of tomorrow because whatever we do today has an impact on well how people will move or how people will act for example in 15 years from now and this is a bit the answer so i think we don't this is a, a graphic from a book from robert Goodspeed who's working a lot with um, scenario planning in the urban context. And this is the city of Dresden in Germany. And he looked at all the different documents over a long period of time, what population development they assumed and what the reality was. So this was always the, the assumptions and the dark black line was the reality. So the only thing which was 
consistent was that they're always wrong. Nearly, there's one, this one is not that bad. But it's it's super hard also to listen this very particular case because well, it's, a, it's a small detail. But anyway, we don't really know what's happening. And every time when we make an assumption, it's very likely that we're proven wrong. And this is the only thing which I think is quite coherent about the past. Or as said by Hermann Kahn, one of the early futurists, the most likely future isn't. This brings us to the point of departure, which is we have complex challenges across different dimensions, and we have an urgent need to design solutions which are adequate in order to solve at least some of these issues, which, however, work both with the local diversity and uncertain futures. The goal is thus to work on a design decision support tool, which does a couple of different things. And the question which we are, the research question which we formulated based on this is how we can support the design processes. And the design process is not product design or service design, but also policy design. So it's a bit in the different dimensions. Second part is about some of the early contributions. So as I said, it's the end of the second year, early of the third year. So we have already done a bit, I hope. There's still some time left and uh, quite a lot of things to do. So um, I want to talk a bit what we did so far and also what methodologies we are using for the application cases, which I'm going to talk about afterwards. The first one is we see our mobility as a as a complex system or a complex adaptive system. So we had a conversation earlier at the coffee break about what is mobility, transport, and so on, which is a very recurrent conversation. So what is part of a mobility system? Is it just the metro system? Is it just something? Or is it a combination of a lot of different things? And we are trying to see it in a way where, for example, people are also integrated. It relates a lot to presentation from floor earlier on the, the infrastructure. But it also includes the digital systems and includes the energy sector, of course. It includes a lot of different parts which are connected. And we organize it a bit based on interviews and literature on primarily three different layers. So the layer of people, which includes behaviors, practices, preferences, and so on, the mobility service, and the infrastructures. That's the first part. The second part is the simulation of alternative futures or scenarios, or the scenarios, let's say, the way we use in order to do so through the integration of trends and uncertainties. And the last part is assessing these different alternatives and using them for some kind of strategic insight. I'm going to talk primarily now about the second part. And here we are going back to our personas, our family, which you already met before. So earlier you were in the year 2022. Now you're, let's say, 2030, 2035. And Mathieu, the child of the family at that point, will have a job or will have, have to go to work in some way or the other. And the question is, depending on the context, even if he lives always at the exact same place, if it's a very high dense environment with a good infrastructure, he might take the bike. If it's a very techno driven environment, he might take the autonomous shuttle. Or if we are completely in the teleworking mode, he will sit at home and not go to the office at all. So this is just, it's a very, very restricted visualization, let's say, of the diversity. But these changes of behaviors, of choices, make a very significant difference on how we have to plan the mobility systems for tomorrow. If we visualize it a bit different, this is one of the, the earlier works which we, um, which we tried to do. So we took a futures cone, which is used a lot in the, in the futures field, and tried to adapt it a little bit to our, our needs. So we are currently here, and the further we go into the future, as more different possibilities are there. And then what you see in the end are different scenarios. So they're, theoretically, they're infinite scenarios, but it doesn't make sense to work with infinite scenarios. So normally, there's a number, let's say, between three and four, five, six maximum. And then they're distinct, uh, distinct. We distinguish between them, for example, if they're probable or plausible or possible, if they're preferred, in case they're preferred, preferred by whom, on what basis. So this is, let's say, a little bit the, the conceptual framing of it. But then the question is, what, what are these lines in between? Because this is the, the possible pathway which we are going through. And we want to understand what impacts this transition pathway or what allows us to to try to understand a bit how it works. For that, we focus primarily on two things, trends and uncertainties. Also there, Julien had already the question on, on what trends we know or we really know of and how we can, can quantify them somehow, but also how we can assure that they will continue after COVID. I think you gave the perfect response to it because we cannot really, we don't really know what's happening. We can make some assumptions on it. And then on the second level, we have the uncertainties. So these are really the things which we have no clue about because it not no clue, but don't have a lot of ideas about because it can go in many different directions. Trends, 
defined as the anticipated future development with high level of certainty that is assumed to hold true for all different future scenarios are, for example, population growth. So it's very unlikely that we have a decrease in population in the next 60, 70 years, depending on the country. If you talk about France, it will be quicker. We will have an aging society, primarily, again, in the national context. And the metro aging is relatively probable because we can see it coming every day a little bit more. So th those are trends, and we can integrate them into our, into our planning today. On the other side, we have uncertainties. And there's a lot of speculation, depending on who you ask, what people you work with. If you work with people from IRT, then the, the uncertainties are, or the assumption on uncertainties is very different than if you work with, with urban planners, for example, because we have very different assumptions on, on what people do, how people will behave, what, what you want. And one big factor in mobility, of course, is the individual car ownership. So Mariana also has been talking about that. User preferences in general, why do we do the choices on what basis, but also the spatial part. So how is our urban environment going to look like? Do we have to go very far? I think many of you know the concept of the 50 minute city, which was very much promoted or is very much promoted in Paris. So all of these are elements which we don't know in which direction is going to develop. We can hope, we can say we would like it to go in this direction without necessarily knowing what the impacts are, but it's uncertainties. So we have many trends and many uncertainties, which means we have a million of different scenarios, which is probably the case, but it doesn't help us a lot. So what we are trying to do in order to reduce this complexity is exactly using the scenarios and simplify them. And there's a very nice approach developed earlier by Jim Dater, later developed in, in other fields, and recently from Nishkolski applied to the uh, mobility context. So you made a very large uh, literature review on all the different scenarios you can find in urban mobility until 2030. And he categorized them, maybe not with the best names, but grumpy old transport, which says things stay as they are. At an easy pace, we transition, but not very fast. Mine is yours. That's uh, the scenario of Mariana with the mobility as a service. So you share more or less everything. And then tech eager mobility, which is really autonomous shuttles, everything, what, every way we can use technology. This is the general part. Now it's the local adaptation. So how can we adapt this to the local context? And there I come back to the, the system or, or the complex system definition. So we have the people, we have the services, and we have the infrastructures. They are, of course, all interconnected in a million different ways. But what we are trying to see a little bit is the, the order of the connections between them. So what impacts what and which change in one of them affects how the other the other layers and what we are trying to do a little bit is to say well the population development is what, what comes first they define the demands for the for mobility services they de um, define where development takes place but at the same time the infrastructure so the built environment big floor you made the reference to the no no further land grabbing or no no further artificialization so there are constraints coming from different parts but generally there's a a bit of an order and a bit of an interaction between all of them. This we translated a bit into a framework, I guess, more or less, at least a colorful graphic, which tries to explain a bit the different ideas. So we have the different layers we have, and the different scenarios, which in this case are the ones which I showed before, but they can also be very different ones. And then the question is, if we want to know the contextual scenarios, which are possible for 2030 or 2040, how can we adapt each of the different layers in order to well work with it and see if a mobility service, for example, works? First one would be the people. So what are the demographic uh, developments? Again, trends, uncertainties. The next one, the infrastructure. How does the built environment react to it or has to react to it? And then the service layer. Afterwards, assessment and visualization. This as a framing, let's say, from a, from a methodological part. Now the application, as I mentioned, we work primarily here in Paris Saclay. Um, and now very soon, meaning next Monday, we're going to add a second case study, which is on in collaboration with the American University in Cairo and the transport agency ZIP there to have a little bit of a diverse context. So we have two application cases here and another one in, in Cairo. However, we have a very similar context as here, where you have a long uh, or a very dominant public transportation intervention and uh, the, the idea to transform the behaviors of people. 
I want to talk about the first one, which is a bit of a future proofness, even if I don't like the word, because it says that we can prove something for the future, which we cannot, but the attempt to do that for a certain mobility solution. And again, the first layer is people. So how, what, what differences can we see in people's behaviors on people's characteristics, their social economic uh, characteristics, their preferences, where they live and so on, for different scenarios such as these. For that, we are using two different parts. Personas, Flo has been working on the chair and Flo has been working on it for a long time. Um, personas are, let's say, archetypical descriptions of people. And at the same time, we're trying to link it to static populations or let's say any kind of more quantitative approaches to working with the human dimension. And we do that by trying to cluster existing people and redistribute the clusters for different scenarios to see how we can integrate them in both qualitative and quantitative design process. And just to give a very brief overview, here we work with all the Ile de France region, even if we only care about the mobility within, because people come from outside. And we use different clustering methods in order to define a number of clusters, took the information from that. I don't want to get too much into detail, but that results then afterwards in in personas, which are a little bit like the characters for our presentation. So for example, the, the cluster number nine, which we have at the moment is an unemployed married mother of one child born abroad, living in a three room, 60 to 80 square meter social housing, blah, blah, blah. So those, this is the level of detail of, of variation of humans today, which we can see how they are distributed in different areas and in different age groups throughout, um, well, throughout the Ile de France region. And then that's the interesting part is the integration of the, the trends and the uncertainties. It's trying to adapt how we can integrate demographic changes, overall growth, but also uncertainties such as changing preferences into the process. And for that, what we are doing more this is we're trying to redistribute the, the personas, so or we are trying to redistribute the different individuals according to our different assumptions coming from literature and interviews throughout different scenarios to have a different constellation of the population, which then in the other way around can inform both qualitative um, design process through having scenario, a contextual scenario and a persona, but also can, for example, inform the generation of synthetic populations of different future scenarios. And yeah, this is uh, more or less just the way back. So taking also the information from the quantitative part to inform the qualitative elements. I think I'm already talking too long, so that's no, okay. I will anyway try to hurry up a bit. This is the first part. I was just really, really brief on it, but the idea is more or less to combine different qualitative and quantitative elements, spread them about uh, through different scenarios in order to see <coughs> in different possible futures how would a certain solution, for example, function or not function. Second part is the infrastructures. It's a beautiful sketch, not as nice as the other ones which, uh, which we got, but a bit simplified, but the idea is the spatial environment. If we have a very strong population growth in one particular place, how does the urban environment has to adapt to it? Here outside, you see a very good example because very few years ago, there wasn't much. Now you have already quite a somehow urban area. And depending on how the development of the plateau continues, it will either be completely densified at some point or it might stagnate at some point. So this has a significant impact on where, for example, trips start, where what services are needed, what the questions of accessibility and so on contain. And then finally, there is the third dimension, which is the mobility service, which is of course uh, the end goal of the whole process. And this is the question, what, what mobility service, how would current mobility services work within these different contexts in, for example, 2030, but also how, can a potential future uh, mobility service serve this context? And how can we make sure that it is robust across different scenarios? And this is what Tarek is going to talk about in about half an hour from now, I think. So there's questions on the integration of different modes. There's questions on fleet sizing and so on. So again, very on a quantitative and precise size, how that could be integrated. And that brings me to the conclusion, which is that we, what we are trying to do is get to people-centered and sustainable uh, mobility futures in, by considering trends and uncertainties in the process. We do this through a scenario-based design approach, which is using a lot of methodologies which exist already, but extending and adapting them to our context. 
integrating, for example, the localization part. And we try to use as many simplifying elements as possible, such as archetypes, the personas, and so on, because it makes all of these things much more tangible and on the one side possible to work with people who don't work with uh, large or with big data or whatever. So we have a qualitative approach in order to, to work with it. On the other side, it's also a way to work with the future because we have no clue what's going to happen. But the simplification allows us to categorize a little bit different trends and try to see how they might look in order to see the, the possible reaction to yeah, our mobility service changes and so on. And the next steps are the continuation of the two application cases here, as well as the replication in a very diverse, but also very critical context where a lot of the mobility changes or challenges today already exist much more so in the future, which is going to be in Cairo or new Cairo more precisely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions in the room? Yes. <laughs> uh, um, one question. I, I've seen somewhere in the slide yeah, the, the, the term quality insurance. Does it refer to the fact that uh, maybe you, uh, you can set up some kind of uh, management tool that will uh, support uh, some uh, adjustments uh, or, uh, I don't know, the a reflection towards the, um, the the integration of the best way uh, during the the time uh, the evolving, evolving time. That's that's the idea. Thank you for the question. If I would have told you a question before to ask, it would have been that one probably. <laughs> um. So I will, I will try to repeat it. The question was on the quality assurance. Was it in this slide or was yeah, it? Yeah. 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 So it's about the the assessment part, but the different dimensions of the assessment and how or what the goal is behind it, if it is the goal to, for example, ensure that we can, well, somehow accurately represent the, the pathway, or? Yes, but there's also the, 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 the dynamic dimension. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, included in your approach, but uh, uh, yes, I don't remember yeah. all, all the other So throughout the time, so that you can, yes. So the, the impact assessment or the assessment part has a bit of different dimensions. One of them is a bit related also to what Julian was presenting earlier. So it's really the impact, the, the economic and uh, impact assessment and so on. The other one is impact evaluation, which is if people work with futures, what happens to their way to work, to work with it? So how does it change their, how does it transform their way of working? And the other one is the quality assurance or the, the how to say it, uh, floor, please intervene when I say something that is wrong, but it's the- the, it's on the scenarios actually. It's trying to find out how the scenarios need to be in order to be valid and useful. So what are the characteristics? Yes. And then that also becomes over time very interesting because you can see, well, did it fulfill the role it was supposed to fulfill? Is it accurate? Does it somehow fit? Can we readapt them? So also we don't see it as a, say if we would do it in an exercise for 2040, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be a single exercise today, but it would have to be a, some kind of a, maybe to take my favorite ice cone. Every time we move one step here, yeah. we have to adapt because it's going to be different possibilities from there. So it's like a moving cone which comes with it and it would have to be reevaluated. And then every time, see, oh, well, I think this is also a way how we can improve our accuracy, even if it's very difficult, because even in the no past, we know that it's very difficult to be accurate. And take a look at the paper you have 12 or 13 cones. Yes, the there are a lot of cones. <laughs> If you are keen on codes, <laughs> can you can uh, say so. code, code ID? <laughs> yes, it's a very dangerous field. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So, if, you, if you come back on the slide, uh, you can maybe just assume that uh, what, what do you put in the scenario visualization? Very good question. I like your questions today. Um, so we have, we talked about it from time to time, but not in a very precise way because it's it wasn't the most important part yet. But in the end, in order to make it tangible, and that goes again to the fact that it should be a tool for people to use, it needs to be <coughs> usable by people. And there are different parts. So here it's written, probably not possible to be seen by everyone. There are personas, media, and stories. So personas are our way to transform human stories or people characteristics into something tangible. 
And their visualization, it doesn't just mean visualization as images, but also text and so on. So you have a person, a bit like, I don't want to go to the other slide, but you have a photo, you have a name, you have a characteristic, you have a bit of a story behind it, which makes it, and I think that's been used for quite a long time, since 2003 by Microsoft, they started to use it for all their products to really, well, you know, very well that's all. But it's, it's, it's one part on, the, on that visualization. On the scenario, it becomes a bit more tricky. So they're normally always stories around the scenario as well. You can visualize them. They're very artistic approaches where it's very abstract art nearly. And there are other ones which are really precise visualization. So I think it depends a lot on, on what you want to do. And in our case, I think the, the story part, the people part is one very important element. The other one is the space. So through maps, through develop or through platforms, for example, where you can see the development density change in different areas. That's one way where also in, in planning scenarios it's used to really show the not where a building will be, but where more people will live, for example. So I understand that uh, in the, the final methodology at the end of the PhD, you will go and sit there, providing some tools and uh, some steps to... Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yes. So I'll repeat again. The question is if I, I try to go there. So the focus currently lies on the, the colored ones, but we cannot really get to the end of a tool without integrating at least a part of this. So even if it's maybe not the most important part, and we probably more rely on existing work, but it's it it needs to be there in order to make make it tangible to work with them. Are there any questions online or yes. Have you um, talked about uh, remediation uh, technique? Uh, you know, uh, the communication or tech, tech uh, available? Um, could, could you rephrase the question just to, that I'm sure that I understand correctly? For the rem remediation, when you, you are on the code and you, you have to to change the way people uh, act? Or... OK, so about the, the transformative part. Let's say where you try to change, you see this might be a possible pathway, but we want to change it in one way or the other. Yes, well, in the end, this is of course a goal. It's not just a goal to see what could happen. It's one way to apply it today to say what could happen and what might work in the future. But the interesting part is of course where you could say, um, for that I will go back to the, the other slide. I find it. So now this shows the, the whole timeline, but then there's this area of preferred future. And this is, mm -hmm. it's very hard to define. There's assessment part again, what, what is preferred? For whom is it preferred? Because people have very different preferred futures. But there's a very important part, which is the, the backward influence of, of futures or the backcasting as it's called. So the opposite of, of backcasting or uh, forecasting, where you look at what actions do you have to perform today, tomorrow, and five years in order to get to a certain future. So this is not adapting while you're on one, but this is, let's say, preparing to get into a certain direction. But there are many other, other tools which are really in the transformative part, which I think we worked more on at the beginning. But at some point, we were like, OK, let's focus primarily at preparing or supporting decisions done today, which should inform in one direction or the other in which direction we move, but a little bit less on really the, the tra different transition dynamics which, which happen along the way even if they are very close, both very close connected. So it's, and then on the technical side, uh, futures is a, futures studies is a very broad field. So uncertainties is a topic which applies in many, many different places. I think we, we have a very typical approach for certain fields, for the future studies field, but there are incredibly many interlinkages to any kind of technical intervention at different stages but we try to, I think, not have it in the, the broader level, but for example, in the, the modeling of population dynamics. So what, what tools exist where we can see what kind of different ten, uh, trends can be integrated and so on. So the, I think the technology part would be, but again, feel free to say something different, but I think the technology part is there as a supporting tool to integrate uncertainty into sub parts of the overall framework. Could you Say a little word on what you're going to do in Cairo, just a little bit. Yes, I will. <laughs> uh, Marina, you want to ask your okay. question? First? Just a, a question regarding the how you plan to give the 
parameters of what a good scenario is uh, and what you know already what a good scenario is, how to choose uncertainty to, uh, to validate as a next step toward a scenario. Yep. So th this goes again to the, the quality assurance of, of working with scenarios. For example, I talked a bit about the number of scenarios. And if you have two scenarios, it's like one against the other. If you have three, it's the one in the middle and you have the two competing. So you don't want one, you don't want two, you don't want three. But four, for example, is a good number because you have a bit of a, a range. So there are certain very simple ways. And then if you have more than seven, eight, nine, it becomes too complicated. So this is on the numbers, for example, one part, on the trends and uncertainties. Um, it's really about finding the most important ones and trying to simplify it to something which we can manage. And for this, we are using the, the archetypical scenarios because it allows us to, to choose from a lot of different uncertainties, focus on some of them and translate them into something, even in some cases numeric, which is more tangible than other things. So it's the, I think it's in many cases, it's a choice. It's a bit of experience from literature and it's also a bit the experience which we have from the workshops and so on, which, where we saw that certain things worked and other things didn't work. So it's a bit of a learning process to see what, the idea is, I think, a bit to have a checklist on if you want to work with a scenario, what do you, what boxes do you have to check in order to to fulfill the the requirements of the process like that. That's one of the the deliverable of, of your PhD. It's that's one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's I think very valuable. Then I think. But maybe I, we have to move on with just if you want to say just two words on what you're going to do in Cairo. Yes, um, I'm going to be there for two months in a collaboration between here and the American University and Transport for Cairo, which is a, an organization working with a lot of tra informal transportation as well. And we are looking at the one of the monorail developments, which is a big development going all the way from the east to the west and connecting some of the new satellite cities, which are existing slowly around Cairo, so new Cairo in the future, the new capital, and the city of the 6th of October on the other side, and trying to understand what different possible scenarios are there after the monorail has been built, so what, what changes are possi possible, focusing primarily on the, the people's behaviors and preferences, so as one part, trying to understand the behaviors as much as possible as they're there today, and the possible impact on the future. And another part there is also very strong, so there's the urban urban planning, urban development department, which with whom we are collaborating, is how the spatial setup can possibly be adapted or might possibly change in the future to make certain modal choices more interesting. So in very simple terms, where do you need a street for people to walk? How does the street need to look like in order to get to the monorail to take the public transport to go somewhere instead of a car? That's idea. I can report back in two months. <laughs> There's one question online, but I think we're a bit. I think we're a bit.